you still have leftovers, I mean, um, I live right down the street, you know, about like a 10 minute drive, so please let me know and I'll be sure to make sure I make a grand entrance to your home uh, with the plate, uh, you know, with my daughter with me, uh, and we're just going to have some great fellowship, amen. Uh, but what should be the focus now, and as we are done with missions and we're done with Thanksgiving and uh, now we're all turkeyed out. <laughs> Uh, what should be the focus? Uh, you know, we have one more month left of 2022. That's crazy. One more month, and then 2022 is bye-bye out the window. Amen. But uh, I do believe the call of the hour is for us to finish strong. You know, Gary Ryan Blair once said, many will start fast, few will finish strong. He also said, what kind of competitor sees the finish line and just slows down? Who does that? Always finish strong. Leon Ho is an author, uh, also like a very guy uh, who's very prominent in the, the tech world. And uh, he once said, it's not enough to be an enthusiastic starter. You must also be an optimistic finisher. Which brings me to the title of my lesson today is to finish strong. Amen. Amen. And if we're going to finish strong as a region, then there's two areas I believe we need to focus on at this moment. Number one, just having a no-limits mentality. And number two, making sure that no disciple is left behind. Point number one, no-limits mentality. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, say amen when you get there. You know, if, it's a lot of things we can focus on as a church, and we're going to get the results of what we focus on. But I believe right now, as it's the last kind of segue to the end of the year, it's two things primarily we need to focus on. One is going after the loss, and two, keeping the save safe. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, say amen when you get there. Amen. We'll pick it up here in verse 7. And it says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat his grapes? That wouldn't make sense. Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? That wouldn't also make no sense. Do I say these merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Is it about the oxen that God is concerned? Let's pause here real quick. Here Paul is talking about a little bit, hey, this whole concept of not muzzling an ox, it was something that was held and shown in Levitical law because it was an agricultural climate at the time as well. So you have the oxen kind of tilling the fields, and as they're tilling the fields, they would typically eat food. And as they're eating food, guess what? They're getting stronger. Kind of like our Thanksgiving holiday, amen? A lot of us, such as myself, it looked a little malnourished a little bit. And, but after that incredible mac and cheese for my wife and so much food from others, man, I'm just full. And I'm getting stronger right there, amen? However, when you muzzle ox, now you, you guard in his mouth. It can't eat and get the strength that it needs to continue to do the work that's before him. We pick it up here in verse 10. It says, Surely he says this for us. Doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us. Because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we do not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. And the church said... Here, Paul had no limits. It says, Paul says, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel. And here's the thing. It was the climate of the first century, and I believe it needs to be the climate of the 21st century. Of those disciples or those who want to call themselves Christians to have a no-limit mentality. To do whatever it takes, to put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel for reaching all nations. Are you with me? You see, when I went into full-time ministry, this is the same mindset I had to have. But honestly, when I made Jesus Lord, it's the same mindset I also had to have as well. You see, when I was studying the Bible, uh, I was it real already into my career um, working in a nonprofit setting in the San Francisco financial district. At the time, single, so all the money kind of, you know, is mine. <laughs> you know, no kids, no wife at the time. And uh, I remember studying the Bible, and at the time, roughly around 2015, um, I was making over $50,000, so that's pretty good. 
when you don't have a lot of responsibility, amen? I didn't have a car at the time, so I was able to pocket a little bit of money there. However, I had the dream of going to ministry, and then I was like, oh, well, I got to be sacrificial so I can make my time and, 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 and a lot more time in my life to, to cater to doing the ministry. And so what I did, I went into debt. I bought a car. Obviously, it's debt right there, right? Then, uh, in order to supplement my income, because I, I had to, like, go part-time, and then it got to a point where the church was able to pay me um, full-time, uh, I was able to quit my job in nonprofit, where I was making, over, again, over $50,000, which is above minimum wage, to settle for not even barely making minimum wage, to drive an Uber to supplement my income and work at a coffee job, right? To put up anything rather than hinder the gospel so that the church can grow and thrive. Are you with me? And that's the type of culture we see all throughout the book of Acts, is it not? We see people being sacrificial, and it was just a heart matter. It doesn't mean everyone got to quit their job. I think don't do that. That would be very careless there. But what I'm getting at is the faith the guys had, the heart disposition the people had to do everything to grow the kingdom around the world. But a lot of us want to live in the book of Acts. A lot of us want to be a church looking like the book of Acts. But we gotta, I want to put this before you. You can't have the book with Acts without the Gospels. There would be no book of Acts without Jesus' ministry. And so let's look a little bit at the type of culture Jesus was creating for his guys. That wasn't even full time yet. Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Jesus is teaching this, 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 this very elementary teaching of just be a disciple. <laughs> Have a no limits mindset. In Mark chapter 8. We pick it up here, and oftentimes we, we live in a culture now where people just make Jesus soft. Yeah. It's like, yeah, Jesus loves everyone. It's true. He loves everyone, but he has a standard, <laughs> and he wants us to, 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 to buy into that standard that's going to make us great and not mediocre. In Mark chapter 8, we pick it up here in verse 14, and it says, the disciples have forgotten to bring bread. Oops. Dropped the ball right there. Amen. <laughs> the disciples have forgotten to bring bread. Except for one loaf they had with them in a boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Isn't it because we have no bread? Aware of the discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Kind of like what Abel and Esther did, an incredible job of having a good eye and a bad eye there, right? Do you have eyes but fail to see? And ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Here Jesus is pushing his guys, and he's pushing them mentally. And here's the thing. He just didn't push them mentally. He also pushed them to be sharp. Let's go over here to Matthew 15. We're going to do a little study here. I think it's important for us to just get a, a glimpse of what the church should look like. Because this is what Jesus called his church to be like. Those who call themselves to be Christians. In Matthew 15, we pick it up here in verse 10, and it says, Jesus called to the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. So you can eat bacon. Ooh. Um, if you choose to be vegan, vegetarian, that's fine. Jesus not, he's not knocking you off, you know, but man, meat is, 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 is good. Right there, right? And it says, it doesn't defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Verse 12, it says, then the disciples came to him and asked him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Lead them. There are blind guys. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? This is Jesus. And so Jesus, he's pushing them not to be hard and very, uh, you know, cynical or whatever. He's pushing them to be sharper. Like the Bible says, you know, the, the, the ax is dull, but it, it needs to be sharpened. And so Jesus is pushing his guys mentally. He's pushing them to be sharper. Some of us need to be sharper in our dress. We need to be sharper in how we carry ourselves and our conduct and being on time. 
Jesus is pushing his guys. But also, he's not just pushing them in, in mental aspect, but he's also pushing them in their faith. Let's go over to Mark chapter 6. Again, we're just looking at Jesus' ministry. These guys are not even full-time yet. They're just disciples. In Mark chapter 6, we pick it up here in verse 45. So a little context as you turn it into pages there, Mark chapter 6, a little bit before this, he's feeding the, the, the 5,000. And so Jesus put it amongst his guys because they were called to serve as well because Jesus just didn't come to be served, but he came to what? Serve. And so he was calling them to be disciples to serve and get their best to God through their servitude and being humble. And so they had the task of making sure everyone was well fed, 5,000 people. That's a lot. A lot of us, we were maybe 20 or even less than that for Thanksgiving. It was a lot already, right? But imagine 5,000 people. And Jesus is like, hey, you're responsible to feed this person, this person, this person, this person. Okay, cool. Jesus, we're done. No, 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 no. Now we've got to clean it all up. Clean it all up. Make sure everyone goes home satisfied. And guess what? Because of your sacrifice, I'm going to take care of you too. Here, here's some more loaves of bread. Amen? We pick it up here, Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Check this out. Jesus is pushing his guys. He says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. And going on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd, after leaving him, he went up on a mountainside to pray. That's awesome. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them. The lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the lows. Their hearts were hardened. It's interesting here. This storm just didn't come about. Jesus made this storm happen. And you can see, like, he's pushing his guys to be radical. He's pushing them beyond their threshold. They just fed 5,000 people. Jesus allows this storm to happen in their life. Just to see, just test their hearts. Like, hey, let's see if they're going to still believe in me. There's it's so much going on in their life. Let's just see if they're going to still trust me here. And Jesus tells them, hey, take courage. It is I. In other parallel passages, he says, you have so little faith. Jesus is pushing them in their faith here. But he's also push, pushing them physically. And a lot of us, we have our thresholds when it comes to our physical aspects. I'm just so fired up that Southland is sold out. Because we have women of wisdom who, who push themselves beyond their thresholds and they give their best. We have people that uh, shut in at times but still show up at church giving their best. So it's awesome. And that's, that's the type of the, the lifestyle we all should have, right? But we see here, Jesus is pushing these guys physically. They're straining at the oars. They're just not like, man, this is awesome, Jesus. Great Lake, no, nah, they're straining. Like, they're like putting in effort. They're tired. But Jesus didn't back off. You notice that? He didn't be like, okay, cool. No, he was pushing them. So we got to understand, like, okay, this culture, why was Jesus creating this culture of this no limits mentality? Why? Well, was Jesus just doing this just because? Like, was he just getting a kick out of it, just laughing at the disciples? Like, man, they're dumb. Man, like, they they need me again. Or was he just trying to play leader? Like, hey, I'm the leader. You need to do what I tell you to do, man. That's what I said. God sent me. Like, what was it? Like, was he just getting a kick out of it? Look at Luke chapter 22. We're just looking at the Bible right now, guys. Looking at the Bible and seeing the type of culture Jesus pushed into those who called themselves Christians. In Luke 22, we pick it up here at verse 35. It's a little bit towards the end of Jesus' ministry now. And we see in verse 35, it says, Then Jesus asked them, the them he's referring to as apostles, his disciples. He says, When I start, I mean, when I sent you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now if you have a purse, take it. Amen, sisters? <laughs> and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, say your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, 
he replied. So what was this whole aspect of Jesus pushing his guys? Why did he push them mentally? Why did he push them in their faith? Why did he push them physically? Well, one, he had to push them. Because Jesus understood, like, his time on earth was limited. And something we take for granted oftentimes in our lives is just time. We don't know whether it's tomorrow's promise. We don't know whether the person in your life that's there now is going to be there even tomorrow. So you better bet your bottom down. You better use today as the most opportune time to learn as much as you can from God, learn as much as you can from the person that God's put in your life, because you don't know if they're going to be there tomorrow. But also, Jesus understood the whole purpose of him coming on earth was to die on the cross. And if he wasn't going to be able to raise up the leaders or raise up the group of people who are going to now be entrusted with the gospel. And be entrusted with the gospel and have the responsibility to go to all nations. And they didn't know how to have the mentality to have a no limits and no boundaries of what it's going to take to build up the kingdom. Then the whole world has no chance. The whole world has no chance to be saved because why? People are so fickle and they're going to be so focused on themselves rather than being selfish and focused on the lost world. This was Jesus' mentality, and he had this mentality all the way to the end. You don't have to turn there. But in Luke 13, 32, he says it. When Jesus got word that Herod was trying to kill him, what did he say? He says, dude, you go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. This was Jesus' mentality. He absolutely had no limits to what he was willing to do to save us. And method, he had a method of madness. It wasn't just beating the ear, he had a method to his madness. And this is the type of culture we need to have here in Southland. If we're really going to build up this church, I mean, I, I, I want to, I appreciate the Shay sharing that and being vulnerable up here. To be honest, we haven't been seeing the amount of fruit that we are expected to see because of this lack of no limits mentality that we can have. Why? Because we work hard oftentimes, and we all are working hard, but we all have our thresholds, and once we hit that threshold, we stop. But God's like, dude, I want to do more through you. You can do this. You can totally do this. You know, when I was baptized in 2015, over in San Francisco in our sister church in the Bay Area, uh, the church was roughly around 70 disciples at the time. You know, around the same size of, of Southland as a region. And that was a church. And so we got, I got baptized in this type of culture just but, and it, was, it took time to build it and for everyone to get on board with it. But I'm grateful because that same type of culture that we had, man, God did so many encouraging things through that. Um, we, were, we were tasked to plant the church in Sacramento at the time in 2015. But here's the crazy thing. We were tasked with it, but no support financially to go get it done. It was all in the church. Like, hey, you got 70 disciples. You better, you better plant this church over here in Sacramento. It's all of you. Raise the full funds. And so I appreciate the mentality that the church had because of the leadership and where the leaders were trying to take the church as a whole. And because of this, I believe the church really bought into that mentality that we had over like 25 tagging events just to fundraise. It's just what it was. We had to get it done. And guess what? We did get it done. Now you got a church in Sacramento because of that. Amen? Amen. But I I really think the church needed this. Like They needed to be pushed and and, and to work hard because they were working hard. But it was, a, it was a crucial moment for the church. It was a crucial moment to, for the church to finally see, like, wow, God can work through me. And, 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 the, and the boundaries I put upon myself and the limitations I put on myself, God could do far greater than that. And the church bought into that. And though we were like, man, they pushed me physically. Another tag, another fundraiser on Friday night, on Saturday night, and everyone got to be there? Like, man, and over 25, like, 25 fundraiser events, some of them back-to-back, week after week. Why? Because the church had a conviction on having no limits mentality. To the point, seven years later, now the church of San Francisco has over 400 disciples. Why? Because it became the culture. What happened? Was it because they read a different Bible? No. Did they drink some, like, special juice, like, that made them, like, Superman? No. Was it because of their leadership? A ah, little. The difference was that everyone had a conviction and believed from the scriptures that God can do immeasurably more through their lives. It wasn't just a few people. It, everyone bought into it. So it became the culture. It became the norm. And when it wasn't the norm, it looked weird. 
to be honest, it was the norm in the scripture, so it has to be the norm in our church. Are you with me? You know, for us, here's the thing we got to get a good conviction on. We could do anything we want to do for God in this church. That's the freedom we have in Christ. We could build the church however we want to build it. It will be tested, though. But here's the thing. We get to build however we want to build. And I just want to put it before us, like, open up your spiritual eyes for a second. Let's remember, we did it before. Yeah. Like, I mean, just this past spring missions, just to remind us as a, as a, as a region, Southland was tasked to raise $108,000 for missions. And here's the thing. People bought into it. We had a no limits mentality. And guess what we got did? He far see that go over $20,000. That was in the spring. But just this past week, again, we had another fall special missions, which is our fundraiser efforts to see churches all around the world for those who are visiting. And we were tasked to raise $67,000. Now think about it. We just, we just came from a, a special missions, right? It's the holidays. We were tired. We were exhausted. A lot of us, like, we gave our best then. <laughs> and we're asked to be stretched more. Oh, you, God, come on. Can you make it happen? You know, like, but man, I'm, I'm grateful for the saints here in Southland because we, we went up and beyond, and because of that, we were able to blot our goal and go above that. Amen? Yeah. But here's the thing. That's just special missions. That's just special missions. Just to remind you, like, we can have weekly additions in this church if we want to. Yeah. We can totally do it. Here's the thing. We have done it before. Months ago, D'Amico got baptized as a teen. The week after that, our dear brother, McGill, um, Flores got baptized, right? Like, we did it before. Like, what's stopping us from doing it again? Here's another thing. Bible studies. We can have as many Bible studies as we want as a region. We did it before. I'm just reminding us. I'm just the messenger. Don't, don't stone me, right? I'm just the messenger. Like, we did it before, guys. Out of, as a group of going through so many transitions, just like the rest of the church, like, we had the second most Bible studies in the L.A. church for like weeks at one point, for weeks. That's crazy. But it shows you the amount of potential we have when we actually work together and have a no limits mentality. And this could be in other areas of our lives too, like we can have a 100% weekly contribution with no one on that uh, missing list of giving. We can totally do that if we want to. We can have this house packed out. We had it before in the past, before mission teams, and before we lost the place and we got it back, amen? We can have this place packed if we wanted to. No one's stopping us. The only thing that puts limits on what we can do is ourselves. It's ourselves. Let's just imagine this for a second. If the whole region was all on board and just going after it, just having a, a no-limit mentality, like, Hitting your threshold, because we all have our thresholds, amen. But, but trusting in God and having the faith that, man, I, I, I could do a little bit more. Yeah. I could just do a little bit more. That's what makes things extraordinary, right? Just that little extra. I could do extra. And as it says in Ephesians 3.20, as, as, if we believe the scriptures as Christians, it says, now to him who is able to do it immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us. Every single disciple has a power within them, which is the Holy Spirit. And it allows you to, to go far greater heights than what you ever can think of or imagine. That's what Jesus was trying to get his guys to understand. Because later they were going to receive that same spirit that we're talking about. But the question becomes, for us as a region, are we willing to let God's power work within us and through us to do immeasurably more? You know, I want to challenge us as a region Let's have the faith and have the, the no limit mentality to push beyond our thresholds, that we can actually do more. That even though it's the holiday season, the harvest is still plentiful. Yeah. The workers, here are some practicals. Let's each of us make a commitment to just set up one or two Bible studies this week. Yeah. It's doable. I mean, if you can't do it, we can sit down, we can talk. I believe it's doable, though. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. If you actually believe that, just set up one Bible study or a two, you can push yourself to do two. But just imagine that 74 people, that's 74 Bible studies. And so if, if you get two, it's double. It's totally doable. And here's the thing, like you could go 
been it's the holidays, a lot of people are shopping right now. You, go, you don't have to just be on campus. You can go into your neighborhoods. You can go into the grocery stores. You can go to the gym. A lot of people are in the gym right now because of Thanksgiving just happened, right? <laughs> so you can use, your, use, use your, your, your area around you, but have the faith and just have a no limits mentality to go after it. But go after it together as well, amen? And I want to put before you, for those who are studying the Bible, make a decision to study the Bible every single day and get baptized, amen? Yeah. Point number two, no disciple left behind. Let's go to John chapter 17. You know, again, we're going to focus on two areas. If we want to really close out this year strong. One, yes, we've got to have a no limits mentality. Continue to push ourselves. Like we've been pushing ourselves for 11 months now. But we've got to push ourselves past the finish line. And so point number two, having a no disciple left behind mentality as well. Look at John chapter 17. And let's look at Jesus' life and his heart for his people. In John 17, just a runner-up, Jesus is praying and speaking to God, and he's also praying for his disciples. And I love his heart here. We see in verse 11, it says, I will remain in the wor world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Again, no disciple left behind. Here, Jesus made sure his disciples' needs were met, and so therefore no one was lost. Everyone was taken care of. And obviously we know in order to fulfill scriptures, well, one had to be doomed for destruction. It was Judas, because that was the whole purpose of, you know, God's plan so that Jesus could die on the cross, die on the cross for our sins, resurrect on the third day. But we see God's heart here is that he didn't want no one left behind. God cares so much for his people that he wanted to keep the safe safe. And here's the thing. It wasn't something just, it wasn't just a New Testament type of idea that God had. It's also shown in the Old Testament. Let's go there real quick in Ezekiel 18. Because I think sometimes we can think about God as like, well, God in the Old Testament, he was just smiting people and just killing them left and right and yada, yada, yada. But let's see God's true heart. Because I think sometimes when we study the Bible and we read the text, we can develop our own ideas of who God is. He's, he's just merciful. He's only forgiven. Or maybe he's not forgiven to those who didn't repent and all these different things. But we've got to take the whole nature of God. You've got to let the scriptures reconcile itself. Amen? In Ezekiel 18, we pick it up here in verse 30. Just a little uh, backstory is God's people now, they're in captivity because of their sin. But look at God's heart still in the midst of all of this. How did God feel about his people? Ezekiel 18, verse 30, it says, Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from your offenses, then, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Here, God wanted no one left behind. Now, one may say, well, I think God was just doing that because those people were, like, already right with God. Like, you know, like, of course God was doing that. What about the wicked? Well, I'm glad you asked, and I'm glad you are concerned about that. Let's, let's look over a couple of chapters later. Look at Ezekiel 33. I just think there's something we just got to drill in. We got to understand the, the full nature of God and who God actually says he is from the Bible. Amen. Look at Ezekiel 33. How does God really feel about the, the, the wicked then? Okay, let's look. Ezekiel 33, look at that verse 11. It says, say to them, as sure as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Here, even God cared for the wicked. Because God didn't want no one perishing and going to hell. Why? Because God's conviction, he wants all men saved. This is the whole point why Jesus came to earth, to give us that opportunity. But also to understand the full nature of God, you do got to understand too, yes, God doesn't want everyone to perish, but also God will also allow people to make the choices they make and go down that path so they could come to their senses. They could hit rock bottom. They could hit hardship. So they could actually come to their senses and see what they're missing which is the goodness of God. 
We see this to be the case in John 6. You don't have to turn it there, but it was during Jesus' ministry where he put the relationship on a line. He was teaching his word, and people got very, you know, kind of basically offended because of his teaching. And he even asked his 12, those he was raising up, he's like, hey, you don't want to leave too, do you? And they were like, Peter, like, hey, where would we go? Like, you have the words of eternal life here, right? But here's the thing. Jesus was willing to put the relationship on a line just to keep the standards the same. And we see the same concept even in the parable of the son. Look at Luke 15. I think this is something we got to get a conviction on. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures, but I just really want to make sure this church just have convictions on what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Luke 15. Look at verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent uh, everything, there was a severe famine. Again, some more hardship. And that whole country, he began to be in need. Ah, Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. He sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. And for many of us, we're familiar with this parable and this passage where God, who represents the, the, the father, and obviously as the son returns back to the father, it's an embracement there. God is endearing. He's like, hey, give, give, give him a cloak. Let's throw a party. It's a celebration. But oftentimes, I think sometimes when we leave, look at this passage of Scripture, we don't understand the full context of it. The full passage in the context is really just talking about and addressing sin within the church. A little bit before, it's another parable, the parable of the lost sheep. And the Bible, you know, details that there's more righteous uh, rejoicing over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people. And then after this parable of the son, even Jesus is teaching of the aspect of, hey, when you're sinned against, hey, it's better to be merciful and forgiven. Remember, Peter's like, hey, how many times I got to uh, forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus says 77 times. And then all the apostles are like, hey, increase our faith. <laughs> so, so don't intend to be a Christian, amen? But God, hey, he's addressing sin in the church here. To be merciful, to be forgiven, to still give your heart, even amongst those who are unlovable. And oftentimes, yes, God doesn't want no one to perish, but God will allow those to walk away so they can come to their senses as well. We see this in the parable of the lost son. And so in regards to the specific parable, we see God, it's like, hey, God doesn't really go chasing after the guy. He just allows for him to hit rock bottom. Yeah. To Lord willing that he, he comes to his senses, as it talks about in 2 Timothy 25, it says, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive. Here's the thing. God allows us to have some free will. And the choices you make, whether it's going to be the righteous choice that's going to help you get stronger in your walk with God, or it's going to be the unrighteous choice where you've got to face on judgment day and give an account to God. So it's not been about the church leader. It's not been about the person in your life that maybe you feel like caused that, but it becomes about you and God. And here's the hope, that people just come to their senses. It'll make everything like, that's awesome, and they just come to their senses and realize the goodness that they had with God at first. And here's the thing, for some, they do need to learn the hard way. And I think sometimes when we keep shielding people from that, we, we, we cripple them, we enable them, and we become codependent in their lives. Sometimes you just got to allow people to make their decisions. Because that's what God wants. And God disciplines them through that action. And then they humbly come back to God. That's the hope. But here's the thing. Some don't. Let's talk about that. What about those who don't? What does the Bible say about them? I think, again, we got to just get a conviction on this. Look at 1 John chapter 2. One thing I love about 1 John is, is during a time period where, obviously, the, the church was going through so much within the church as well as without. False teachings from the outside try to come into the church, and false teachers even came within the church. 
And you had these people like at this time period, like the Gnostics, right? And they believed that they had this higher revelation, higher than even what God had already shown them. First Peter talks about you have everything you need to live a godly life. We have everything we need. If you're a Christian, you have everything you need. You have God, you have his word, and you have his spirit that's going to help you. You don't need anything else. Obviously, we need the kingdom. We need each other to hold each other accountable. But that's all you need. So the Gnostics and the same philosophy even come in and creep into the church in today's time. We're like, well, what about this YouTube video? <laughs> right? Because social media is so big. Hey, what about this book? And what about this? And we can allow that to like permeate into our mind and our hearts because we're not guarding it. And it trickles into the church and it can hurt the church if we're not careful. So take some time to read the book of First John because he's just addressing this stuff. I was like, all throughout the Bible in this scriptures, he's, he's writing this letter to the church and he's reminding them who they are in Christ. He's like, dude, you know the gospel you once had before. You know that you're saved. You know, you know, you know. It's not a, a feeling that we think that we're Christians. We know that we're Christians. Amen? And so in 1 John chapter 2, what does the Bible talk about this in terms of those who just leave? Verse 19, it says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. To be honest, a hard truth, but it's something we got to accept from the Bible. Either you're building up the kingdom or you're tearing it down. Either you're with us or you're not. Either you believe what Jesus said from the scriptures or you make him out to be a liar, which he's not. So it's one or the other. Are you truly with us this morning? You know, when someone says that they're leaving the church, we just got to understand they're not really with us in the first place the Bible is teaching right here. Something cut in on them at some point. I don't know what it was, but it's a spiritual battle. They were running a good race, and for some reason, they didn't guard their heart. For some reason, they didn't guard their minds, and Satan got in there and took them captive. And the hope is that they come to their senses so they can be saved, and you help them as much as you can. But sometimes, you know what? I had enough. That's what they want. Let's have them hit rock bottom so they can come to their senses. That's the best effort. And so when people say that they're leaving the church because someone didn't meet their needs or say hi or encourage them, you got to ask, like, well, did this person actually have a real conviction in the scriptures? You know, last time I checked, we read so many letters in the Bible, and we got to understand that the, the church, those in the church will hurt us at some point or another. Even us within the church, we're going to hurt others within the church at some point, one way or another, whether it's intentional or unintentional. But for someone to be like, I don't want to follow God no more because the church is fake, well, did you really have conviction? And at one point, did that conviction stop? Maybe it's just a lack of quiet times. That'll do it to you. How many leaders you've seen fall? Look at Solomon. The Bible's full of guys and kings who just stopped following God. And Satan got in there. He's like, oh, it's a field day. But what I'm getting at, that could trickle into this church. And I want us to have a conviction to keep the walls of Christianity safe and keep a standard. I'm not trying to change the standard. I'm just trying to uphold the standard, and the standard is the Bible. I've never seen someone who walked away and had a discrepancy about the Bible because they understand it's flawless. It's never about the Bible. It's really because they don't want to do the standard anymore. They don't want to be held to the standard anymore. And so they're no longer with us. That's the conviction we just got to understand, guys. I think sometimes God works in ways where he allowed things to happen. And sometimes, you know, mistakes from people within our church. And we're not perfect as a family. We talked about that before. We all have our issues. But I think those are highlights and just really reveal the heart. And God allows it to happen to really reveal the heart. Is it about the person or is it about God? Is it about the church or is it really about God? Because last time I checked in the scriptures, we're all fascinated about is that Christianity thrived in moments of oppression. Christianity thrived in moments of when the kings were trying to, like, kill all the Christians. That's how we got the Gospels. That's how we got the letters. And, and we read those same things, and we're, like, so blown away. Like, man, these guys have faith. Guess what? It's the same aspect that we got to put into today in the 21st century. Have real faith and actually have deep convictions from the Scriptures. Are you with me, church? You know, I, I think this is just important, but, you know, I, you know I've been reading this book. Um, over the years, um, and it's called A Lion Never Sleeps. A lot of us probably are familiar with it, right? And this book really depicts the, 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 the lion being like Satan here. And, uh, you know, Satan all throughout the Bible, he's very predictable. <laughs> he's, he's doing the same thing. He's roaming to and from, trying to see who he can, like, take out, right, and devour. Um, 
And, it's, and it talks about Satan kind of being like this lion. And we got to understand, in the, obviously, in the animal kingdom, right? A lion hunts normally uh, when it's prey, like it's, it's easy prey, when it's, the meal is easy. So when an animal is injured, weak, or young, it's just easy prey. Like a lion don't want to put up a fight. It could, but it doesn't really want to. And that's interest, interesting, though, like a, a lion is so big and, and strong. It could take people out, right? It could take animals out if it wants to. But mentally, it just doesn't want to exhaust itself through that. And I think in the same way, Satan is the same way. It doesn't mean he, he won't tempt someone who's strong. He will. But he'd rather go after the one who's not fully mature in their walk with God. He'd rather go after the one who's injured and hurt by the church. Because he could get in your mind, he could get in your heart and tell you, like, hey, it's the church fault. Rather than for you just to take ownership of where maybe you lack that as well. And really what it does, it calls people to want to leave God. And it hurts the church. Because we're a family. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. But when one suffers, guess what? We all suffer. So we all feel this. And that's why I want to address it. Because in the holidays, it's naturally during a time when we all should have time in our hand to a degree. We take work off. And we should be getting closer to God. But sadly, we, how many of us have been around when we start to see people drift away from God? It happens all the time. People fall through the cracks. And that's why we're talking about it. We got to make sure we've been our brothers and sisters keeper and making sure no disciples left behind. Amen. You know, I want to kind of address those, uh, you know, as it says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So according to the scripture, you get stronger by what? Being committed to God. So according to the scripture, when you're not totally committed to God, guess what? You get weaker spiritually. And what makes you spiritually weak is just sin. Sin. And we all get, we all get sin. But the things that make us spiritually weak is our personal sin. Sometimes it's not being connected to the vine, which is Christ. You miss the quiet time. Then you start missing a bunch of quiet times. Then you get weak spiritually. You drift off, even in the church. Not being connected to the body of Christ, which is the church. And so all of these things could cause you to just be weak spiritually. But my thing is, if you are weak spiritually, you only you know and God knows where you're at currently this morning. Here's the thing. Don't stay there. Don't suffer in silence. We're a family. Do not suffer in silence. Confess whatever you have to confess and get open about it. Get the help that you need. And here's the thing, like, if you know someone who's got weak spiritually, don't allow them to stay there either. Help them. Be a friend. Who needs friends when you can have enemies? Yeah. Sometimes I think we could, like, try to pat people and shield them and protect them from maybe not getting the help that they need. And we think we're doing them justice, but it's hurting them actually spiritually. And we got to actually have a conviction, like, even the weak can still get strong. As it says in Job 3.10, it says, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Amen? Amen. I want to challenge this as a region. For those who are on the verge of leaving, you need to make a decision. Either you repent today and you get stronger in your walk with God. Life's good. Amen. And you may be able to be Go through this circumstance, which is like a season right now. You might be able to help someone else who's going through your same shoes later. You just don't know. Or you make a decision to walk away from God, but now you got to deal with God, which is far greater in a, in, a, in a more heavier terms of discipline on Judgment Day. And for those who are already in, plugged in, giving their hearts, here's the thing. Make sure it's your conviction to be your brother and sister keeper by making sure no disciple left behind. Here's some practicals. I think we love practicals. Sometimes people don't care much you know, they just want to know if you care. You know, we, we're such a society where we're very, like, in tune with each other, right? When, when people feel hurt, we can feel that. They're like, man, like, you're kind of off today. Usually you're joyful, you're happy. What's wrong? What's going on in your life? Spending time together. You know, just spending, like, basic time together. Getting in each other's lives, asking questions. Encourage each other daily. Just imagine if everyone in this room was encouraged. This room would be fired up. Just imagine that, like, everyone's just fired up because they're encouraged, their needs are met. Encouraging each other daily. Here's another practical. Confessing your sin to each other. We're family. There's nothing that God can't forgive. He's he forgiven a guy who murdered people, for goodness and grace, right? There's no sin that God can't forgive. However, if you don't repent and you don't get forgiveness, then you got to bear with the consequences, amen? And if you can't win a brother or sister over, then get other people involved. Stop trying to take matters into your own hand. Get other people involved. We're a family. So actually, let's be real family. You know, as I conclude, 
I want to read a famous quote by a wise man named Rocky Balboa. He says, let me tell you something you already know. The world and all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward, that's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not point a finger saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that, and that ain't you. You're better than that. And so I want to put before you guys this morning, Southland, we're better than this. We are better than this. We are children of God. We can do far greater things than we ever can imagine. But what it's going to take is us really believing it from the scriptures if we choose to have a no-limits mentality, that God can work through us to do immeasurably more. And what it's going to take is for us to be our brothers and sisters keeper to make sure no disciples left behind so our church and our region could be stronger than it has have before. Family, as we finish this year, let us not just be a year where it's like, you know what? We finish. Awesome. 2022 is over. No. Let this be a year where we actually finish strong. And to God be all the glory.